Hello everyone. Welcome to Teaching with Magic, a podcast exploring the intersection of education, fantasy, and literacy. Here at Teaching with Magic, we explore the different ways that teachers in the fiction and in the real world make magic for their students. You'll hear discussions about teachers and teaching methods in fantasy, science fiction, and pop culture. You'll hear interviews with scholars in various fields about important topics in education, and you'll get to be a part of an ongoing conversation about why the imagination matters. Welcome to Teaching with Magic. Welcome to the final episode of season one of Teaching with Magic. From the bottom of my heart, thank you all so, so much for sticking around, for listening, for subscribing, for everything that you have done to support Teaching with Magic. I'm really excited because this episode is our first full panel discussion. I gathered several friends of the pod and friends of Teaching with Magic to discuss the current state of teaching. I wanted to check in with some friends who had been chatting with me about their teaching ventures, who'd been chatting with me about different ideas in teaching, and I wanted to get their perspectives for the final episode of Teaching with Magic. So today's panel includes Nick Polk, who's been a friend of the pod and has been experiencing his very first year of teaching. I wanted to get Nick's perspective because Teaching is hard, but it's especially hard in the first five years. So I wanted to see what else I could do to help Nick to help other new teachers. So I invited Nick to join not only as a fellow teacher, but of course, as a fellow nerd and teacher with magic. I also invited Dr. Joe Torres, who you may recognize from the blog post on anachronistic teaching in T.H. White's Once in Future King series and in Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. It was a really fascinating subject, and I wanted to make sure that Joe got some time to talk about the paper, not only on the website, but also on the podcast as well. You'll also recognize Jordan Rennells, who has appeared on the podcast when talking about the magic of soundscapes. I also invited my friend, PhD candidate Rebecca Davis, who's going to talk some more about teaching in higher education and teaching Tolkien in higher education. This is a longer episode, so make sure you go to the show notes if you want to look at specific topics, if you want to skip ahead, and you'll see that the time links are there for you. So kick back, relax, and enjoy the season finale. Welcome, dear guests, to another episode of Teaching with Magic. I am here today with several panelists, and today we're going to talk about the joys of teaching. Let me introduce you to some friends of the podcast. We'll start with Nick Polk. Nick currently serves as the production editor for Malorn, the academic journal of the Tolkien Society. He's a high school English teacher and has written various articles about Tolkien, adaptation, pop culture, and theology. He co-hosts the Tolkien Heads podcast with Trip Fuller from Homebrewed Christianity, is the creator of the Tolkien Pop Substack, where he writes on the various intersections of Tolkien and pop culture. When he is not reading something Tolkien related, Nick enjoys brewing and drinking coffee, listening to punk music, watching the latest television series with his wife, Kelly. Nick, welcome to Teaching with Magic. Thanks so for happy having to- me. Super pumped. Super pumped to have you here. And we also have Dr. Joe Torres. Now, friends, if you haven't heard of Dr. Joe Torres before, he was a guest post writer for the Teaching with Magic blog. So be sure to go over to the Teaching with Magic website so you can read Joe's guest post. Because Joe Torres is a mathematician and a teacher originally from Louisiana, but now living and working in Michigan. In 2011, He earned his BS in math from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. After teaching high school math for three years, he returned to school at Texas A&M University, where he earned his PhD in math in 2020. Since then, he taught math at a community college on the Texas Gulf Coast for two years and now teaches at a small classical high school in the Catholic tradition in South Central Michigan. 
During this time, he earned his graduate diploma in language and literature, focusing on classical, medieval, and Renaissance literature from Signum University, and is now working on an MA in philosophy, focusing on Christian wisdom at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Goodness me, Joe, how many letters do you want after your name? My goodness, that's what <laughs> B S M A M A P H. You're just you're just all the letters. I want all the, all letters. the letters, Elise. All you're the letters. Racking them up. My goodness. And of course, I know you love reading, learning, and discussing math, literature, philosophy, and theology with friends. And you are a proud patron of the Prancing Pony podcast. The best podcast this side of Brie. I won't take that personally as the Prancing Pony <laughs> podcast has earned a few mentions from the Tolkien Society. So yeah, they kind of got a one up, but I, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Joe. And speaking, Thanks for having me. Speaking of the Prancing Pony podcast, we have a previous guest of Teaching with Magic, who is the editor for the Prancing Pony podcast. Hello, Jordan Rennells. Welcome back. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Jordan is an audio engineer, composer, and teacher from Ottawa, Ontario. So you are, in fact, the only non-American teacher on this panel today. <laughs> My goodness, we could have some, some different perspectives here. All right, on with your bio. Do excuse me. Jordan has spent several years studying sound engineering, music, and teaching from college and seminars in Nashville with Victor Wooten and other renowned teachers and musicians. He has taught recording technology and sound design in Ottawa for over the past few years and is currently spending his time creating full audio soundscapes for fantasy and sci-fi books. Go check out those soundscapes. <laughs> They're so good. And Make sure you go back to episode six of Teaching with Magic for season one, because that's when D Jordan and I talked about teaching soundscapes. So you are also designing sound effects and writing original scores to create, and I quote, a movie for your ears. <laughs> oh my goodness. And it's so good. They're so good. I'm so, I cannot wait to get Winnie the Pooh. I, oh, it was oh, so much fun. That is so much fun. fun. Do that one. Oh goodness. Yeah. yeah. Go, go listeners. Go, go, go. Okay, so Nick, I want to start with you because this is your first year of teaching. You have made it. Congratulations, you made it to Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I, you know, as it's like the first year ever, um, I like probably two weeks before the break, I was I was really feeling the fatigue. I was like, it's it's got to get here soon. I was counting down the days. The days were going slow all of that normal teacher stuff, I guess. It is normal. I will say that no, every, every teacher knows that December fatigue where you're just trying to get to the break where the quote unquote end is in sight. So in general though, how is teaching going so far? How's that first year going and how can we help you continue with your journey? What can we do here at teaching with magic to help support you in this first year? I appreciate you asking those questions uh, and having me on. It's uh, I'm a longtime listener, first time guest. Uh, what you guys do is really important. Uh, you know what you do, at least in connecting fantasy with teaching. And so um, when I saw that you were putting out audio stuff, you know, uh, as opposed to just kind of keeping it blog related, I was stoked that I could listen to you uh, on my commute to school. Um, but it, you know, school teaching has been good. It's been more challenging than I thought. I've been a multitude of other things, um, including like a social worker, a pastor, a barista. You know, I've kind of gone back and forth on some different things. And I've been able to kind of lock myself in after about two to three weeks and feel pretty confident about my job. Um, and teaching has not been that way. It has been... Um, when I every time I think that I've got something down, uh, a student throws a curveball my way, and uh, I'm like, "Dang, I uh, I don't know what to do at this point." And so, uh, yeah, so I've, I've talked to administrators, and everyone's been very supportive um, at my school, and I've got a good team of teachers and good mentors and everything. So um, that's been really fun. Um, teaching with magic, you know, I, I've told you at least before we hit record that one of the biggest episodes that influenced me was your science of reading 
uh, episode. And so a lot of those um, kind of scaffolding concepts of kind of starting at the beginning and building up from those previous learning abilities of kids learning how to read the, 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 um, the sign, the decoding and encoding stuff, right? And so learning how to do that on a high school level with like um, more deeper meaning and text um, has been was really really helpful and so just you know keep uh keep putting out the 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 episodes like that you know where i can come in and and bring and bring uh bring some cool concepts into my classroom to make me sound smarter than i am i can definitely do that uh, you know as a reading specialist that is my day job so going back to those foundations and i gotta say like talking to people like uh dr andy higgins and larry swain was really helpful because those are some of the core beginning concepts. Like Anglo-Saxon has most of our language, most of our words in the English language come from Anglo-Saxon. So knowing Anglo-Saxon has been really, really helpful. I mean, I going to Catholic school, I knew a lot of Latin roots and I knew a lot of Greek roots. Uh, Joe, I'm sure you could speak, you know, as a math and as a, as a mathematician, most of your content specific words are Greek or or Latin. So knowing the Anglo-Saxon part of it was really helpful because I realized that a lot of our, our morphology, our, our basic morphology comes from Anglo-Saxon, whereas our more content specific words, like our more context specific morphemes come from Latin and Greek. So that was really interesting for me to discover as a reading specialist. So Anglo-Saxon all the way. And I had no idea. I had no idea until I learned, until I learned from Signum. So I'm really glad that that's been helpful for you, Nick. And thank goodness for Tolkien in that respect, because I don't think we would have learned all that if it weren't for Tolkien and for Lewis, like actually pushing those ideas in the English curriculum. Yeah, it's true. I, you know, just in I, Tolkien really helped me launch me into being a better student in college because I was absolutely one of those people that was I was in college for a degree you know what I mean I thought school was for fools type of a deal I was there to have a good time um, and realize that if I didn't do my schoolwork I would fail and have go into debt for no reason and so someone said why don't you start reading something and so I read Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and uh, got involved in the Tolkien Society and you know it brought me to this group, the Prancing Pony, teaching with magic, et cetera, et cetera. So like you said, Tolkien and Lewis are important, not just for reading, but for getting you connected with some professional teachers. Yes. And it's, it's fun to learn from, from the greats, really. One of the goals that I have for teaching with magic, at least, is to figure out exactly how they taught. Like, I want to get in Lewis and Tolkien's heads like see if I could because I'm not 100% sure how Oxford like I've talked to Gabriel Schenk a couple of times about how Oxford actually works but if I could somehow find a way to like transport myself to Tolkien's lectures or to his uh, tutorial sessions that would be so great so that's that's a that's a teaching with magic goal that I have see who I can talk to about that Anyone, do you guys have any advice, uh, Jordan and Joe, for uh, for Nick, any advice on how to how to get through the first year of teaching? Because the first year is the hardest. I, Hard. I have one piece that I tend to give first year teachers. The temptation is to try to do everything. Yes. Um, and and uh, and spoiler alert, it's actually impossible to do everything. So uh, do what you can, but allow yourself to rest is my, is my big advice. No, that's helpful. And I definitely broke that rule. Uh, definitely with my first month where I was, everybody was kind of leaving, you know, at the times they were supposed to. And I was there 45 minutes to an hour later trying to put together the best lessons of all time. No, leave, leave <laughs> at your contract hours. Okay. Leave. <laughs> Unless you have something where you could fill in a timesheet. Leave out when your contract hours are over. Otherwise, you will burn yourself out, my friend. Yes, I have but remedied it's... my sins. So good. I have the, the past three months, I have been leaving at my good. contracted time. <laughs> good, good, good. 
Jordan, how about you? Any advice for Nick? Um, well, I feel like my experience in teaching is maybe in different scenarios, but uh, regardless, um, I think that the thing that helped me the most when I started teaching was just asking myself that um, what do you know for sure question. I ask that to myself about everything. Um, because a lot of the time, especially in music where with uh, what I teach, it's pretty common for people to, for teachers and for students, but for teachers especially to spew out terms and, and uh, you know, the names of things and think that that means you know what they are. Um, so I spent a good deal of time asking myself, you know, what is this topic really and what do I really think about it and writing out notes about it. Because when you watch, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more later, but when you watch some of the people that I would say are some of the best teachers, um, you can tell that they know the thing so thoroughly. And it's not even that they know it so thoroughly, it's that they know what they think of it so thoroughly that they can speak it clearly without notes or anything like that. And uh, so I, for, for me, what helped was putting in that time to, you know, choose topics and be like, what do I really think about this? How would I structure it in the best way to get the message across clearly? I had a lot of time after I graduated my recording program, I taught people in the Center for Assisted Learning. And so I had to teach the people who, uh, you know, it might take the longest time for them to get the concept under their under their fingers. And so you learn pretty quickly out of necessity uh, that you have to be able to explain that idea in multiple ways, but also in the simplest and clearest of ways where you have to do away with all the assumption that someone might understand context or someone might understand some of the terms that you're saying. Um, and the, like I said, that's a huge hurdle for people that teach music, I think. You know, you take for granted that people even know what a note is. Um, and to not be able to go back further than that, I think is a, a shortcoming of uh, someone who tries to teach music. So that was a really long answer, but uh, there you go. <laughs> Don't be as long-winded as me. There you go. That's the uh, that's the real lesson. <laughs> and know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Don't ramble yeah. on like I just said. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's it's really easy to assume what students do or don't know. So that's a really good lesson for not just in music, but for all. I mean, especially because you know it so well, that yeah. you forget that someone else might not know it so well, and. Uh, really digging into the smallest aspects like that. Yeah. And, you know, would someone know this um, if they're brand new to it? <laughs> yeah. That kind of thing. So would it be fair to say that we must unlearn what you have learned? To quote our dear friend Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, teaching with magic. We're bringing in some Star Wars here, people. It's It's going to happen. Joe, let me ask you about your time in teaching paper, because you wrote this paper specifically for the, there was a King Arthur class at Signum University, and this was for King Arthur Reimagined, taught by, I remember, it was taught, I believe it was taught by Dr. Gabriel Shank, and your topic was specifically at on anachronistic teaching, so this, and you looked at anachronistic teaching in Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain and T.H. White's uh, Sword in the Stone and Once a Future King. So how did you get to this topic? And what did you discover about your own teaching and practices while you looked at Merlin and Morgan as fictional teachers how did you, how, A, how did you come to the topic? And B, how did it help you reflect on your own process as a math teacher? Yeah, that's a great question, Elise. Um, the, uh, as you said, the, the course was a course at Signum, which was uh, designed and lectured by Dr. Gabriel Schenk, who's a brilliant lecturer, uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, and uh, this was my final paper for the course. 
And my uh, my preceptor for the course was Dr. Serena Higgins, who's an amazing uh, writing mentor, uh, just generally speaking. And um, and so she gave a lot of structured advice on how to come up with a good paper topic, which I found very helpful because the topic was just the assignment was just write on something related to what we've been reading. And it's OK. That's very broad. Uh what will I do? Um, and, uh, and so, um, I, I remember I had a conversation with her and I said, well, we haven't read it yet, but I really like T.H. White's The Once and Future King, which is one of the main texts that the course was structured around. Um, and I, uh, found, uh, and I really, uh, I really gel well with the character of Merlin in this thing. So I'd like to write about that. I don't like to just write about one character in one novel. I like to think intertextually. Um, and so I wanted to compare him with someone in another novel. And the thing that intrigues me most about Merlin in The Once and Future King is that he's living backwards in time. He was born in the presumably the 20th, 20th century um, and and then he ages backwards in the time so that he's an old man by the time of King Arthur, um, which is a really weird trope. Uh, and uh, and so I um, thought about all of the possible things I could compare that to and other things that we were reading. And I said, well, the only one that really comes to mind, uh, because we had we we were doing Arthurian literature from Tennyson forward. Uh, basically. So 1800s forward. The only one that came to mind was Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee, because of course he fall, finds himself farther back in time than he uh, realized. Uh, and, and, and so I said, well, let me just look at these two teachers uh, in, or let, let me look at these two people in their time backwardness. And is there something about them that I would find really intriguing to analyze? And of course, I'm an educator. So the thing that I found most intriguing to analyze about them is the way that they educated. Um, and so that's that's what I did. I, I kind of read um, some papers that were about their teaching, how they functioned as teachers and how the authors functioned as teachers through them. But then I also compared it with an essay that was written by two uh, scholars of pedagogy who did an analysis of different archetypes of math tutors, um, which is the, which is where my experience lies. Most of my teaching experience has been math teaching. And I started out as a math tutor at the college that I was at when I was an undergrad. Um, and so I really was able to like see myself in the different archetypes in there and know what he was know what the the two pedagogy scholars were talking about. And so that was that that was how I came up with the essay topic was by by just sort of reading through all of this stuff. Um, and and so what what I did is I realized that, what I really appreciated about Merlin is that he was often trying to, he was often doing quite well what I try to do as a math teacher, but find myself unable to do in a lot of ways. Um, and, and so I wanted to pin down what was that, what was that wet, what would, what was he doing that I was finding myself unable to do? And it, it's not so much because of the magic, that, that that breakdown was happening because Merlin has one singular goal. He wants to teach Arthur. He wants to give Arthur learning experiences that facilitate him solving the problem of violence and war in society. Um, so it's geared towards solving one problem. And, and, and I, as a math teacher in the modern world, um, often can't see my curriculum in that way my curriculum often is like here are all of the different topics that you have to cover or your students can't pass the act or the sat or the you know whatever and so i realized there's this there's this very different very different focus that merlin is able to bring to things that i find myself unable to bring sometimes 
And and so what I, I, I ended up concluding in that paper is we need to re-envision the purposes of education uh, because if we're getting bogged down in the I need to prepare people for the standardized test so they have to be able to do these things, then we're going to prepare them precisely to take those tests and not to solve new problems, um, not to solve problems that go beyond those tests at all. Um, because that's what Morgan does in a Connecticut Yankee. He says, oh, well, let me teach you how to build a factory and how to do all of these little tiny things. And then everything explodes at the end in a very literal way. There, there are bombs at the end. Uh, so everything explodes at the end. Um, and That's and, a very, very compelling metaphor. <laughs> right. Yes. I thought so. uh, oh, gravy. Yeah. So anyway, that's what I, um, I, I just realized that there needs to be this re-envisioning of, of why we're doing what we're doing and what our actual goal is. Otherwise, we can't accomplish what, um, what say, Merlin is able to accomplish in, in the Once and Future King. Agreed wholeheartedly. I mean, teaching to the test, unfortunately, it's what a lot of us, you know, we get that pressure to, um, especially Nick and I in the, in the under in the secondary world and in the, even, even for me in the elementary world, like my kids, my students are taking their state tests in third grade. And it drives me nuts. It, it, it drives me nuts. I'm like, just let them be kids, please. We don't, uh, but yes, we do need this re-envisioning. And if we're going to learn math, we need to learn math for the beauty of solving problems and learning how to problem solve. You know, it's not, I could, I could memorize my 12 tables all day long, but I need to be able to use it. Right. And that memorizing the times tables, right. has a place. I'm not saying that that's totally not important, but like by the time you get to high school, if you're only doing this sort of rote memorization method, mm -hmm. you've, you've taken a wrong turn somewhere, you know, right. and, and not again, we, we always need to memorize things, right? You, you mm -hmm. build on facts. So you need some grasp of the facts to build on, but, but the facts aren't the point. They're the foundation. Right. And you have to do something with that foundation. Right. Exactly. What kinds of problems are you going to solve? Can you apply them to say a music education or to computers or even to digital humanities. I mean, look at the work that, that James Tauber is doing in the Digital Tolkien Project. Now, most of what he's talking about is very mathematical computational analysis, but it applies to texts and to English and to Tolkien's work. So yes. Absolutely. Oh, and what wonderful timing. We are now joined by PhD candidate and friend of the podcast, Rebecca Davis, who of course popped in at this moment with a lovely pun because she's Becca. What else would she come with? What? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, hun. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good, you guys. How's, how's it going for everybody? It's good. It's good. Glad to see you made it in the nick of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I could not resist sending that. It made it's, me it happy. Was, it was pretty nice. <laughs> it was pretty nice. So, so far we were just, we were talking, uh, we chatted with Nick about his first year of teaching and how it's going. And if we have any advice for Nick in his first uh, year, how about I'm, you? I'm, I'm, si I'm sending you virtual pints and cups of tea and caffeine. I appreciate that. There was lots of uh, there was lots of excessive drinking post uh, post school days, uh, oh. especially towards Christmas. <laughs> no, yeah. like I I remember now. My first year actually teaching was in a public high school, and it wasn't the greatest situation um, support wise because I I'm, I'm not trying to scare you off, <laughs> but um, this is kind of a horror story of how bad it can be. Um, they took a first year teacher and gave me the most preps out of anyone in the department. And two of those preps were for high stakes um, population. So first year taking the high school English 
state tests and graduating seniors. God. So I, I, I got to the point where, and this, this was when I knew it was like, I've got, I've got to find something else was I was drinking a, like, I was feeling so sick going to work. Um, like I was having to drink Sprite. Yeah. I, and so that is to say, make sure you've got Sprite on hand, but I definitely hope your situation is a lot better than mine. Mine was. <laughs> I definitely have a lot more institutional support. I uh, I teach on an alternative school, so the student behavior is a challenge. Mm. Um, but uh, I have lots of uh, administrative support and a good teaching team. So thankfully, the pressure isn't as high to on state testing at an alternative school. So yeah. But now, if if I could jump in though, with kind of piggyback off what Joe was saying though about. Um, with the issues with state testing, and if we just teach towards that, that's all they're going to learn. I'm seeing it as a um, as a college instructor. I'm seeing the end result of that, where if the students that are produced from this teach to the test mentality, when they get to college where there is no state test, they're freaking out because they don't know how to. Think um, critically or creatively. They just know. Uh, oh well, it, it's what. Well, what is the right answer? And if you tell them, well, there is no right answer to something. You you have to be able to support your answer. It, it blows their mind. So we really aren't doing even not just in math, we're really not doing our students any favors by not teaching them to think outside the box and, you know, let it be like Merlin. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a place for thinking inside the box. Like mm -hmm. you said, Joe, there's like there's learning the foundation, but there's also like you've got to learn the rules in order to break them at times. So not only learn the rules, you know, learn the grammar. Yeah. Be like Merlin is very good <laughs> advice, Joe. I would agree. Um, but, you know, learn the rules, but also learn to break out of those rules. I constantly think back to the Harry Potter series and just there's a really big difference between, say, Professor Umbridge, who's very teach to the test, like we're only going to learn the theory, no practical work. <laughs> but and then you have on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, Gilderoy Lockhart, who just lets loose pixies in the middle of class and says, go catch the pixies. And you're like, what? what do I do? So let's find that balance. Let's find our Remus Lupin. Let's find, you know, that, ex you know, working with the tools that you have and learning the tools and then being creative with those tools. May and maybe no don't pull a uh, Mad-Eye Moody, um, Moody and, you know, I'm just gonna throw you out with the <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe don't wolves. maybe don't curse your students yeah. with magic I'm, or with language. I'm I'm just saying though, Malfoy had it coming. He was a great ferret. He was a wonderful ferret. <laughs> he was. So let's talk about our favorite teachers in pop culture. I'll Jordan. I have a strange suspicion that I know who you're going to say, but I'll let you start anyway, because we started with Nick, we started with Joe. So in popular culture, who would you say are your favorite, some of your favorite teachers and what qualities do they have that you admire? I have three. You have three. Um, I love it. I could choose more than that if I wanted to go into uh, fantasy realm teachers or things like that. Um, Qui-Gon. But uh, if I were to choose my three, it would be Richard Feynman as number one, for sure. Um, and it would be Victor Wooten as number two, probably. Um, and number three would be Josh Waitzkin. Um, so Feynman for his, uh, as I was kind of speaking to earlier, his clarity of knowledge and the simplicity that he can deliver it with. Um, and the lesson that I learned from him that was like the most critical, I think was the short little video you can find where he talks about, uh, the names of birds and, and his interaction with his dad about it, I believe it was. Um, so 
he would say, and this is a Richard Feynman, the theoretical physicist, you know, who can understand all these really, really advanced topics. And he was talking about how his dad would make up names for these birds. And uh, the lesson was that the name of the thing doesn't matter if you don't know what the thing itself is. Uh, and if you can't, you know, describe it in, in a way that's not just its name. And like I was saying earlier, that's a huge thing with music theory, um, especially people teaching the names of things and not really even knowing themselves what they, what they mean. Um, and that kind of leads into Victor Wooten, who mm -hmm. uh, always teaches with uh, what's called coyote teaching. That's his kind of technique that he goes to, which is basically in a nutshell to just answer questions with questions. Um, because the student a lot of the time knows more than they think they know. And I've never seen someone as good as Victor uh, at getting the student to explain what they're asking um, to the teacher. So mm -hmm. uh, getting that knowledge out of them and just tell, kind of showing them that they know more than they think they do and that there's more to asking a question than what we were talking about earlier, which is just getting the answer, getting the immediate answer to pass the test. Yeah. Um, and then Josh Waitzkin is a chess player. He was a chess player. Um, he wrote a really, really amazing book called um, The Art of Learning. And I would recommend it to anyone uh, who is teaching or is interested in, in, in improving themselves in any way. Um, but he talks about a concept called making smaller circles. And that's uh, something that I've thought a lot about, um, which is just zooming in, you know, as minutely as you can on a concept um, and seeing how thoroughly you can know just that one thing um, and then building from there, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, those would be my three. I love I start it. start rambling. On. <laughs> no, but that's fantastic. That feels like a very, very Wizard of Earthsea concept. It's you can know a name of the thing, but as soon as you know the name of it, you need to know everything about it, all the characteristics in that name in order to enact that magic. So is Richard Feynman a wizard of Roke? I don't know, people. What do we think? No, just an awesome bongo player. All right. Just an awesome <laughs> bongo player. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nick, how about you? Who are some of your favorites? Yeah, I decided to limit mine to two, similarly to Jordan, because I think all of us here probably could have real life and fantasy teachers uh, and just <laughs> go on and on. But so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring mine just and limit it to the fantasy area. I just have two, and number one's uh, got to be Gandalf, my guy. Uh, he is like the the coach who. Uh, tells you to do stuff that you're not you feel like you're not ready for um you know he, he speaks into you he tells you that you're smarter than you are right he, he shows up to bilbo's house and he's like yeah you're a burglar and he's like no i'm not i'm a you know and even the doors are like no Gandalf's like yeah you are uh and he's he's super cryptic he's like that cryptic professor that plants those little those seeds in your head and they'll say stuff and you're like what does that even mean gandalf what do you mean uh, that the wisest don't know the end, even the wise don't know the end, you know? And then you're like, oh, okay, you take, you go for the ride and you're like, I, I know what you're, you're talking about now, Gandalf. Um, and you've been uh, both simultaneously telling me how much of a fool I've been for not seeing it, but also, uh, you know, applauding me when I do come in sync with your, uh, you know, esoteric, uh, pedagogy or whatever so Gandalf is is this weird guy who comes in and uh he encourages people to be better than they think they are um and plants the seeds so that later uh you know you come back and reflect and you you're like dang Gandalf's got the the wisdom there uh and my second one would be Katara from Avatar the Lost Airbender love Katara um you know, specifically when she's older and she in the Legend of Korra where she's like teaching, she's like the super healer. Right. And she's, uh, you know, because she's she's more combat oriented and in the the first Avatar, the last airbender series. So 
I would want to learn probably from like, I think I would probably want to learn from like, probably like a 30, 35, 40 year old Katara, you know, where she's still able to, you know, kick some ass, right? Still doing that, teaching that. And then also at the same time, able to bring in some of those healing skills. I feel like Katara is very patient when it comes to teaching, you know, and very impatient for people who don't have uh, the right, uh, what's her intentions you know that's where she's impatient which is is good she's a she's a morally upright character and so bringing that element where she brings the morally uprightness um and i think she would be a good teacher for lots of various aspects um would bring patience as also the the fire as well yeah katara is great i love katara she's the best dude she's the best yeah i definitely want to do um Iroh, I want to, I want to do Uncle, I want to do an analysis of Uncle Iroh one day. Please do that. But I should Please do an do analysis. That. I will. I know, but I should do an analysis of Katara. So then you'll be able to say I wrote. Slam dunk, slam dunk from Rebecca Davis. Mm-hmm. There it is. Oh, Jordan said sorry, Jordan's but she's not. This. She's yeah, not sorry. No. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry, Jordan. <laughs> well, no, no part like the reason Jordan's not like he's recognizing why he has so many edits on the live recordings. <laughs> it's all because of you. You stoked the fire. Those are always such a fun time. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. You can always tell when Alan and the whoever's co-hosting have looked at the discord. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like, oh, damn it. What did Becca do now? <laughs> <laughs> Becca, let's go to you then. How about your teachers? I want to hear about your teachers. Oh goodness. Oh, it's funny you mentioned Uncle Iro because I he is on my list as a top three. Yay. Um it's yeah, I definitely think with Nick, like, yeah, an older Katara would be awesome, but Uncle Iroh's already there. And he's just even like we get a hint of this even before the events of Avatar The Last Airbender in those flashback scenes where, you know, it's um, the letter he's writing home from the siege of Ba Sing Se. He still has a res he like the letter shows a respect for his enemy that you do not see shared by any of the rest of the Fire Nation, really, the, the key players. So it makes you wonder, okay, what, what exactly has he learned? And this is when he's a young, you know, a younger uncle Iroh. And he just has such a patience too, that it's okay. Yeah. Sometimes the best way for a student to learn is to try it their way, even though I know their way is going to end up, you know, blowing up in their face. Um, but you learn and then you're there to pick them up and give them that cup of tea and sage advice and, you know, tell them that I was just afraid you lost your way. And oh, I still can't watch that scene without just bawling my eyes out. Um, so, yeah, there's on one hand, there's Uncle Iroh. He has very much that empathetic, caring teacher that I think we all want to be. Um, I would also say Professor McGonagall. Um, I just love how both book McGonagall's a little sassier than I think we see Dame Maggie Smith um, in the films, but that was the perfect casting. And I would love to have Maggie Smith's profession, Professor McGonagall as a teacher. I would like to be her. <laughs> like that is who I aspire to be. Um and then not to pull in some Tolkien, I'm, I'm not going to say Gandalf, although he's also on my list. It's kind of a toss up between um, Melian, uh, Luthien's mother, because wonderful advice, wonderful counsel, and Elrond, because he does have an awesome library. So he has that store of knowledge. And yeah, that's, I guess that would be my top teachers in fantasy. Although... Okay, at the risk of putting uh, slipping in one more that is not Tolkien related or Avatar related, 
as far as the quirky teacher goes, uh, if anyone has read Tamara Pierce's Tortal series, uh, New Mayor. He he he's on my list as well. Okay, I have not. I've I've generally shied away from Tam to Tamara Pierce for some reason. I don't know if what I, it was, but if I'm remembering correctly, and this if I, uh, this might convince you to go read it. Okay, she based him partly on Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> so imagine like a European accented, you know, vaguely British accented Jeff Goldblum. I love it. So That'll yeah, do it. that'll do it for sure. Okay, I'll give it a try. Absolutely. I think it's really interesting, though, that you mentioned Melian. And I mean, I know we've talked about Elrond before when I interviewed you back in the back in the beginning of the series. But I wasn't, it's funny because there's the person who gives sage advice and there's the person who are, who is knowledgeable in their craft, but does that make them good teachers? Like, I want to say yes, personally, but what do you guys think? I want to trouble, like, I want to trouble Melian a little bit just because no one unfortunately really listens to her advice and is that because of I mean we all know Thingol is just he's Thingol <laughs> and he's got like pride up the wazoo uh, Melian listen to Mama Melian um, you gotta listen to Mama Melian because she knows what she's talking about but for some reason they don't they don't take nobody takes her advice except maybe Luthien and then you've got, um, and then, you know, you have, you have Elrond and people generally do listen to Elrond, but. And I do think it's yeah. interesting. I mean, Elrond is descended from Melian. He is, he is. So it runs in the family. No one listens to Elrond either. <laughs> I mean, you could say that she qualifies as a teacher and she's just like the teacher in the classroom with that with students that don't listen to her mm. right? Could, couldn't you say that that which which could potentially be a solace for some of us i'm talking <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then she has that one star pupil in galadriel that's true yeah there's always one where you you're like all right you're cool you're cool we can we that's can like talk. i'll keep doing this yeah Ex there's always one but yeah, I think I do think Thingol just needs to get his. I probably shouldn't say this in a recording, but he needs to get his head out of his ass half the time. But no doubt, no doubt. Okay. Our boy Thingol did not deserve Melian. No doubt. Oh, no, no, he did not. Oh goodness! All right, Joe, let's go to you. How about your teachers? Who are you, um, who are you? All right, well, I have three as well. Yeah. I'm going to go in reverse order since I'm last. I'm going to save my best for last. Uh, so. So, uh, number three, um, I have Socrates, who is a, a is a pop culture teacher. Um, I have been I have been teaching actually one of our sophomore well one of our philosophy classes at the school this year. We've been reading a lot of Plato, um, so I've been dealing with Socrates on a very uh, personal level this uh, this semester, uh, and uh, and Socrates is like very annoying as a teacher i can see but also like the way that he gets the person to know by just constantly questioning them is amazing which is something that jordan was talking about with one of his earlier and i just really love that and i definitely try to be that when i teach i try to get my students to come up with the answer by questioning them um uh, and uh i mean socrates is clearly the master of this um, so he's he's my number three. Uh, number two, um, I I'm going to reiterate one that Becca said. Professor McGonagall is uh, is is one of my uh, one of my very, I mean, just amazing teachers uh, for inspiration. And I uh, I I guess I want to say for maybe a different reason than what Becca said. Uh, for, to me, um, clearly she's she has high standards. She wants her students to really meet high standards, but she's also, because of those high standards, um, the students kind of see her as a rock um, that 
that they can that they can trust that she because she doesn't budge on those standards they also know that she's that she's a that she's a rock that they can trust um to be there for her and you see that right when like for instance at the end of order of the phoenix when she runs out of the castle during the owl exam and the stunners fire fire four stunners into her chest right and she and and the students are just shocked that mcgonagall's not there anymore the next day that how, how could she be gone like what 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 is a what is this school without mcgonagall right um and and it's just you know like mcgonagall being a rock for the students is is very inspirational for me as a teacher and being kind of growing into that by being by setting high standards but still relating on a personal level with your students um seems seems really important um and then my my final one because the the question was phrased as in pop culture and so obviously not a fantasy teacher but but uh, uh definitely one of the most inspirational teachers for me personally would be george feeney from boy meets world in the 90s uh because mr feeney was just awesome uh and so inspirational for me personally i, I was telling talking to this with one of my friends recently and i said yeah as as an adult looking back some of the stuff that that show teaches you about romance and stuff i don't know about that but the the things that that it teaches you about teaching through mr feeney is just awesome right mr feeney has respect for his students um with, from the very beginning calls them mr matthews miss lawrence you know um uh, but but then so there's respect, but there's also like, here's the standard, you have to meet it. Um, there's, I mean, there's a real love for his students that shines through. Um, while also not like not crossing that boundary of I am the teacher, I'm not your friend, um, which sometimes is a weird boundary to navigate. Um, I just, I just think Mr. Feeney's the best, so... And not discount Mr. Feeney. I mean, Mr. Feeney raised all of us 90s kids. Let's be honest. He he was our teacher. And I almost did the Mr. Feeney call before I remembered that my toddler is sleeping in the next room. So that's just, you know, I know. Uh, yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. And plus Smoglet my microphone. Smoglet has no bedtime. Smoglet <laughs> needs no bedtime. Oh, yes, he does. <laughs> I beg to differ, Rebecca Davis, as his mother who has to deal with him in the morning when he does not meet that bedtime. So <laughs> he may think otherwise. I'm just sorry. I'm just imagining Smoglet dressed up as like a toddler Boromir telling <laughs> Denethor or Fenduilos that. Yeah. Boromir need no bedtime. Oh, my goodness. But yeah, I love those answers. I... I do have to say, I'm really surprised that of the people that I've asked in this series so far, um, in this season, nobody has said Professor X. It it crossed my mind the other day. You know, we've had Gandalf, we've had Qui-Gon, we've had McConaughey, but nobody said Professor X. And I thought, hmm, school story? Yes. But, hmm, I don't know. It just hit me today. I wonder if part of that with X and I'm not, I'm not a huge, I mean, I know the X-Men, I have seen the movies, have not read the comics or anything. I wonder if part of that has to be though, that Xavier seems to, at least in the films, just seems to be training them to do one thing. It's like, you're mm. going to end up being an X-Man. Right. And not, it's like, well, uh, gee, professor, what if I don't necessarily want to be a superhero. I just want to learn how to control my powers so I don't hurt anyone. Yeah, like, that's no, fair. you you serve at the pleasure of the professor now. Hmm. Especially in the comics, this in the comics especially, there's. I think that the professor is a lot more of a kind of dubious character. Hmm. In in like, is this for the students or is this for you and your dream? Um, and you know, I could, you could come up with, you could do a really interesting episode of like the teachings of Professor X versus Magneto. Yeah. Um, Cause that would be very interesting, but yeah, Professor X's motives are pretty, 
questionable a lot of the time. Yeah, and I've never gotten the sense that he's a particularly good teacher either. Mm. Uh, I mean, like, again, I'm not familiar with, uh, like Becca, I'm not very, I'm not familiar with the comics as much. I saw the movies that came out when I was a teenager. The, the, what, what was her name? Um, Jean Grey. The, her, but there's, there's the other one. Rogue. Um, Rogue. Rogue, yeah. Um, she, she, she just kind of melts down uh under underneath what happens at that that's uh, what happens with the x-men and i just i just can't think of him as a particularly good teacher um i think it i think it goes back to a conversation of like are you a good teacher or are you really good at your superpower in this case because you know he's like one of the strongest x-men but so that means that he gets that kind of prestige but doesn't mean that he's a good teacher and it's to bring it back to our world Mm -hmm. it's something that i see a lot with musicians is these fantastic musicians who have who can play like nothing but uh, that doesn't mean that they're good teachers and uh, a lot of the time it means they are um, a lot lower on the teaching quality list i would say Um, and i that comes from me like purposefully pushing back against uh, specifically classically trained musicians um, on why they're doing things. And when I can't get an answer from you, then that shows me that uh, there's something wrong with that. And Mm -hmm. because this is how we have always done it is not an answer to that question. Um, So I've had some heated conversations, but the, the people that I have those conversations with a lot of the time are very, very talented musicians Mm-hmm. And composers but yeah the two are not uh the same thing you know yeah it's i'm immediately thinking of the difference i mean among other differences uh but what are the main differences between gandalf and saruman you can be very good at your craft but being a teacher means you are getting down to the student's level and making sure that they understand what they need to do and saruman could not do that but he was very good at the magic-y things. And he was very wise in the lore. Hopefully none of the professors that you work with, Jordan, are going to try and take over the world and try and steal the magic ring from Sauron. But, you know. But it is a really good example of, you know, what's what's the goal? Is it to do magic or is it to be the teacher? Right. You know? And with Gandalf, it seems to be the teacher. Um, so it makes sense that that's the outcome, right? And you can see that in all of the the fandoms we could choose someone probably from each one where you know when you really look at it is it that they're trying to be really good at their craft or is their craft Mm -hmm. teaching well and kind of piggybacking off of that and it's especially in tolkien's work i think we see that some that question of are you doing being really good at your job or are you teaching we also see that reflected with the relationship between the elves and men because mm-hmm. the elves were supposed to prepare Middle Earth for the coming of the men and, you know, teach them. And on one hand, you get an elf like Finrod Felagund, who, you know, super awesome, you know, OG, perfect elf, who does that. And I mean, it literally ends up costing him his life. Yeah. Versus his uncle Feanor, who's like, oh, no, these nasty humans are going to su- supplant us. And, you know, yeah. So this you've one you've of got... a long list of say, right. Feanor sins. Well, and I think it would be interesting, though, to do a comparison between Sauron and Feanor about, mm-hmm. you know, they're both extremely skilled at what they do. No one's doubting that or questioning that. But it's. It's one thing to have a skill, but what are you doing with that skill? What are some of the methods and practices then that you guys use in your classrooms that you've emulated from some of your favorite teachers, whether it's fantasy teachers or the teachers you listed uh, previously? What are some of those? What are some of the practices that you try to do? Nick, I'll start with you. Yeah, a lot of the tactic tactics that I've used in teaching. Um, 
definitely came from that like one awesome teacher that I had growing up. And she was one that made, her name was Mrs. Faust, and she made uh, books and stories come alive in a way. And it was in the way that she did that was that she invited us to participate in creating things related to it. So we we were reading To Kill a Mockingbird in middle school, and we had to, as we were watching the movie, we had to create our own soundtrack for the movie. And it couldn't be like movie like we couldn't just be like oh this is my favorite song it had to be like fit the mood the lyrics had to fit like you know what i'm saying the ambience and so i had to find the mp3s burn my burn them on a cd and uh we would bring our burnt cds in put them on the little boom box have the tv muted and uh um and play our soundtracks and so she she did all kinds of things like that. But I think kind of like we were talking about, a lot of us have talked about this teaching to this test mentality. Um, you know, memorizing things is important to help us build so that kids can kind of riff and interpret because you can't you can't learn to interpret text if you if you don't know your ABCs. Um, and so um, I tried to so we did um, the Tempest and the Lord of the Flies. So I try to keep it fantasy island type of one kind of part of the unit there um, this year. And so at the end of the Tempest, which uh, I, I, I'm not going to try to convince myself that these kids were stoked on Shakespeare, uh, but I did get them to write their their test for that unit was that they had to write. Um, basically a fan fiction of an alternative ending what ha- or what happened afterwards. But they had, you know, this, the rubric that I created, they had to use details from the text. They could bring in anything if they wanted. You know, I had kids who were talking about how, um, you know, uh, I can't, one of the characters was actually secretly in a drug cartel the whole time, you know, and they've turned it into like an action story, you know, and somebody's talked about how Miranda actually – became the magical one and took over and got vengeance, you know? And so all these different people did, you know, all these students that I had got to do that. Um, and they had to use specific details that I'd put in the rubric for them. Um, and that way you have them taking, I'm a big, uh, Alfred North Whitehead guy who was a mathematician and philosopher. And he talks about moving from the pedagogy of, teaching inert ideas or dead ideas and bringing them to alive ideas. And so giving students the tools to bring texts alive in their own way with still um, having them rooted in the text itself, um, I think is, it, that was probably, that was probably the, probably one of the, f- the few wins that I felt pretty confident that I'll probably keep as my first semester teaching. Um, because they had a good time with it, and they probably remember the Tempest more than anything else I I had we had read that semester. So because of that, because of that um, project, but yeah, yeah, that's a great practice. I I appreciate that, Nick. And, and most of Shakespeare is fan fiction anyway. So exactly. It's, so it's okay if you do fan fiction with his fan fiction. Yeah, I like to tell. I try to tell my students that stories never are just isolated no one just come they don't just pop up ex nihilo right they come yeah with Aro. even tolkien was rocking with beowulf you know without yeah. beowulf well, being and like Lord of the rings um with tolkien his turin turin bar is essentially um kalevala fanfic yeah and i was um teaching uh paradise lost last year and we started out by saying okay guys uh so this is bible fanfic that's exactly what it is. It's Bible fan fiction. And it was yes. it was it was the running joke became, oh, was oh, this is where sexy Satan came from. Yes. Joe, how about you? What are some practices that you like to emulate? <clears throat> well, I, I I'll say one that I tried that did not work first, and then I will okay. uh, talk maybe more generally. Uh so as I said, Mr. Feeney, big favorite. Uh and I did try to call all of my students Mr. and Miss last name, uh, insert last name here. And they all thought it was the weirdest thing ever. And eventually I just said, you know what? I'm giving up on this. This isn't worth it because you guys are so on edge when I do this. So I had to give that up. 
it made me so sad to give it up, but I had to give it up. Um, but the um, the uh, I do know schools where they where everyone does that. And I feel like that would be less on edge for the student if everyone did that. But I was the only one doing it, so that that just wasn't going to work. Uh, but the uh, oh well, what can you do? Uh, but the uh, but but um, with respect to um, what I learned in writing that paper um, that we were talking about towards the, the or earlier in this episode, uh, I um, I learned that I needed to have more of a big picture focus when I was dealing with my students. Um, and so there are days, uh, th there are days when we just, you know, we, we get bogged down in little details, but there are days when I really try and emphasize, okay, how does this fit in with everything else we've talked about? Can we get a big um, network of ideas here so that we can see? And I also focus a lot on meta thinking, like what is the what is the thought process that we're using here? And like, how does this connect to other thought processes? So, so um, for instance, there's lots and lots and lots of different methods for solving equations uh, but a lot of those methods reduce to can you rewrite this equation as an equation that we already know how to solve uh, and if you can rewrite the equation as one we already know how to solve then you can solve that one because you already know how to solve that um, and that's what pretty much all of the methods you learn after let's say the, let's say from the second half of algebra one on pretty much every equation you learn how to solve is well let me just rewrite this as an equation i know how to solve um and so uh, i feel like the this showing them that there are these sort of more big picture methods that we use um teaches them not just how do i do this math but how do i actually think about these issues more generally uh, because if this person gets presented with an equation that wasn't one from this cookbook list that I've been given to teach them, they might still have the idea, oh, maybe there's a way that I can rewrite this as an equation that I already know how to solve. You know, that that sort of thought process is one that I really try to communicate with my students. Yeah, that really promotes uh, critical and creative thinking, which is pretty is pretty impressive um i would and i would say especially important for math but i like that rewriting the problem away in the way you already know how to solve it that's i could solve some world issues right there hmm. jordan what about some uh methods and practices you've talked about um coyote teaching you've talked about um, answering questions with questions. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I won't talk too much more about those ones because I use those a lot. Coyotes, especially a lot. Um, and it's fun to do with the whole class because they really get uh, annoyed. Uh, but it's interesting because it's, it's what we were talking about earlier where they just want the answer. Yeah. Um, and especially like, the classes that I'm teaching at the college here, a lot of the time are recording engineering. Um, and it's basically in a nutshell, the art of problem solving. And so when you have students that come into this environment that are used to like, okay, here's the 10 bullet points and that'll get you through to the end. So just memorize those and you're good. Um, it just doesn't work like that. And it can't work like that. Um, because if you learn the space that we're in and how things work, as soon as you go to someone someone else's studio or something like that, uh, it's totally different. And if you don't understand the concepts, then you can't accomplish anything uh, because all you did was memorize the specific steps that fit here and not the concepts that make them make sense. So I uh, to, to kind of talk about something else, I guess, other than that kind of answering a question with a question scenario, a lot of the time, the biggest thing that I have to deal with is uh, like a typical day, especially at the start of the semester, you know, fresh people come in. I have a 
uh, you know, a studio full of 15 people that are super eager to learn all about all this cool stuff and make music. And that's awesome. And what ends up happening is inevitably there's people that have been doing that already for several years um, and who know how the equipment work. Uh, they know how to use it already, or they think they do. Um, and some of them do, and some of them might even know it, you know, aspects of it better than I do. Um, but then there's people that have never touched it before in their lives and, you know, just got a MacBook that week and uh, have never really used a computer that much because a lot of the students these days have iPads and they don't need a computer. So that's a whole thing too. But trying to teach to both of these groups of students that, first of all, you don't know anything, or sorry, you don't know everything, this side, um, and to this side, it's okay that you don't know as much as these other people um, because they don't know as thoroughly what they think they do. Um, and so something that Josh Waitzkin teaches in his uh, book about chess, um, the art of learning that I mentioned earlier, is, and I can't remember the official terms that he used right now. I was trying to look it up, but I can't remember. But basically, um, the difference between someone who is taught that they are good at something because they work hard at it, and then someone who is good at something because that's how I was born, uh, and trying to separate those uh, two mentalities. And, you know, the, because we have math stuff that the kids have to learn. Um, and there's a lot of students that come in and just say, I, oh, I'm just not good at math. And um, it's really hard to teach those people that uh, you were just, you know, I always try to tell people that there is no reason that any, there's no reason other than time that someone shouldn't get 100% on a math question. And there's a lot of students that have been taught that they're either just not good at it or it's just not for me kind of thing. And so they've taken that and they've applied that that thing that they've been taught to all of these uh, things that I'm trying to break down, you know? Um, yeah, a lot of fixed mindsets of, of, you know, I'm good at this, I'm bad at this, I'm just not a good singer, I'm just not a good, I just don't know, I just was never good at music theory um, and trying to be like, well, that's kind of why you're here though. You're here to learn from the beginning and and just because there's people that have been doing it for five years and are basically, you know, masters at that one thing doesn't mean that you're going to be left behind anymore, you know? Um, because unfortunately, it seems like that's what's been happening to a lot of them is, uh, you know, you either memorize the things to get the test done or you don't. And if you don't, then you get left behind and then the concepts pile on and there's no hope to catch up at that point. So yeah, trying to level the playing field is an interesting challenge for me um, and show everybody that that they can they can all learn things. And it's, it's usually a, like to be really specific and then I'll stop talking. Um, I usually try and find one concept that everybody knows nothing about. Or I get a student that really thinks they know something to try and explain it and I'll ask the questions about it and uh, get really, really minute and really, really annoying about it. And it usually shuts the whole class down to a point where we can restart and be like, okay, now that we uh, get what I mean by knowing something, <laughs> let's start from the beginning again. And uh, and then I get them to teach uh, teach each other instead. And I sit back and watch a lot of the time. So uh, that's super interesting. <laughs> I'll bet that's probably your favorite part of the job because you get to kick oh, back definitely. for a minute. I get uh, that's the most fun because I like to. I always think that teaching is the best way to learn how to understand something. Absolutely, because um, that's what shows mastery when you can right. teach somebody else how to do it. If you right. can teach somebody else how to solve this math problem or write this sentence in its correct grammatical format. I say with air quotes because grammar is always changing, <laughs> then you've shown that mastery when you can explain it to someone else. Right. And but it's yeah. a it's a it's a better learning experience for my kind of scenario to let somebody try and explain it in like 
guide their explanation and then I'll say, okay, let's start from the beginning and explain it better. You know, I know you can explain it clearer than that. Um, and uh, they get annoyed sometimes, but it's worth Oh, it sure. in the end. Absolutely. So, yeah. I will definitely say as soon as you encounter something that you know nothing about, it really gets you thinking about what kind of learner you are and, you know, what you need to do in order to learn that new concept. Because I remember when I took Anglo-Saxon at Sigmund University, I was, my head hurt. Because it was it was hard. It was really hard. And I thought to myself, dear God, is this what it's like for my students when they don't know how to read? Or is this what it's like for my students when I'm telling I think them, knowing you know, that makes the difference between someone who can teach and someone who can't is, you know, exactly. there's so many assumptions that you can make Of course, and of course. you've already lost someone two minutes into your talk um, because you assumed that they know the terms that you're using. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Exactly right. Becca, you haven't shared your methods yet. How about you? So this is going to, this has gotten to be kind of interesting Yeah. because I'm going to start with methods I like to use that this latest semester I haven't found to be successful. Um, and I'm, I'm really big on discussion. I love the Socratic method in my classes. I like students being able to answer it for themselves. I like just being able to talk about the concepts we're learning about in class. But one thing I've encountered more this most recent semester than I have in previous semesters is what do you do when you have a class who, for one reason or another, simply will not discuss? Either they don't have the They don't come to you with the skills they should already have in place to have those kind of discussions and to reach those higher level thinking skills, or they just don't want to talk or they didn't do the reading or anything like that, or some combination. And you might get one or two students in each class who will talk, um, but it's not fair to put it. the entire conversation on their shoulders. So I love discussions, but this last semester, I haven't really been able to use them because I've run into that problem. And what I've started incorporating was when I realized a lot of this is coming out of students post-COVID school where it was a very isolated experience, they're not used to dialogue, live dialogue, is, all right, let's break it down. We're going to put you guys in groups. Yes, you guys are going to have to talk to each other. And yes, you are going to have to talk with, well, I'm nice. I start off, they get, they usually cluster with other people they know. So I start off, they all get to, you know, be in the group with their friends. No more than four people per group. Okay, because once you get past four, it's, you usually get one person or two people who are domineering the whole conversation. The second time, though, that's when we break it up and you guys are going to be in completely different groups. So, yes, you are going to have to talk to people you don't know. You will have to learn the other names of your classmates. And they all have this. Everyone has the same discussion questions. And each group has to discuss them that among themselves. The downside for me is I don't get to interact with it as much. But if the whole point is I want them to get used to exchanging their ideas and to get out of this mindset of, well, there's only one answer and that's the right answer. I want them to be able to support their answer, support their viewpoints, because The, the bread and butter of what I teach is composition, which along with math is, you know, everyone's favorite subject to take. So I've essentially got to have people go from this, oh, I'm terrible at English, I'm terrible at writing to, you know, I don't necessarily like it, but I know I can do it and I know I can do it effectively. And that's to me one, one thing I'm trying to work more into is, okay, let's take some low stakes 
um, activities. You know, I started um, started my classes this last semester off with they have a 10 minute writing prompt at the beginning of class. And it's usually connected in some way to a concept we're learning about. Um, and I don't I don't hard grade those prompts. They're mainly just, did you do them? Okay, great. I'm not grading for grammar. I just want you to practice getting your ideas on paper. Pulling in um, the pop culture teacher though, like practices they do. The low stakes environment, I see that as being, I wanna maintain my standards like Professor McGonigal, but you also have to meet the student where they're at. Um, we can't blame, we can't, I don't think we can really blame the unpreparedness of students entirely on them. I think it's a larger social issue as where, you know, um, modern Western society see how they see the role of education. Um, I also think, you know, it doesn't help to have a global pandemic mess things up. So I've got to meet them where they're at. But then I also want to pull in a little bit of Iro, And I mean, I legitimately, I do have an electric kettle and tea in my classroom um, and my office. Um, I've had students take me up on that and have that cup of tea. And that's when I've noticed we do get those dialogues that I enjoy as an instructor. And they start to get over this whole idea of oh, this teacher is out to get me because I'm in college. And that's what I was told is all my college professors will be out to get me. And, you know, they're secretly plotting ways to make you fail. Which I don't get. Because I know. that's not, I mean, yes, all my high school teachers told me that, you know, your college professors are not going to accept this or they're not going to accept this laziness or they're not going to do this. Or they're not going to do that. My college professors did not care. I mean, the cutest thing I ever saw was I had a student come to see me um, wanting to know if they could use the the F-bomb in their paper. And they okay. were writing a narrative, uh, narrative event essay. And I was like, oh, yeah. And it was it was like I've just I, their eye, I cannot describe adequately just how big their eyes got. And it was like you're going to let me type that? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to be reading it out loud, but go if for it, it. If it fits the context of what you're talking about. And I mean, even in my, like, in I, I didn't pull this with my comp classes, uh, but in my literature classes, I've told them, look, I will not allow modern profanity in class. But if you were to go back and find some old English profanity or, you know, we were we were doing the Epic of Gilgamesh, maybe some Babylonian cuss words. It's fair game. Yes, because it has to do with the content. Exactly. We we had someone one of my students figured out how to cuss in Elvish. <gasps> That's beautiful. It, it was. And I was thinking, I'm not sure the professor would approve, but this is too funny. The professor would, would approve the effort. Yes. <laughs> Maybe not the cursing itself, but perhaps the effort that they took to and it, translate. And it was it was really yeah. more of an insult to um, like something like you stink like an orc's butt. <laughs> ah, I love it. <laughs> That's brilliant. I yeah, I think I think Tolkien would have been impressed personally. Lewis might have been like, oh, the horror, but <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, I guess it depends who came up with the idea to dress as polar bears for a non-costume party. This is true. Good lord. <laughs> they see this is this is why I want to figure out what he was like as a don. Like, oh my gosh, was he the cool professor who just, he was the cool professor who just showed up in a polar bear suit? <laughs> Well, I did read one story. He brought like these tiny little shoes. Uh, uh, Tolkien did brought these tiny little shoes to one class and like was legitimately trying to convince the students that these were elf shoes or fairy shoes. But he hated the diminutive fairy elves. 
Uh, and well, okay. And my other favorite story, um, any Howl's Moving Castle fans? Yes. Okay. So Diane Wynn Jones, and I'm so excited. I'll hopefully be teaching that book this semester. Yay. Um, she had both Lewis and Tolkien as professors. <gasps> and it, I mean, my mind was already blowing. And the way she told this story was that this was around the time that Tolkien was actually writing the Lord of the Rings. And the problem was that because she kept coming and a few others kept coming to that lecture, he couldn't leave. And so he had to deliver the lecture. So she's like, yeah, we may have, we may have delayed the publication of the Lord of the Rings by a year because of that. But oh. she, like, she talks about, you know, Lewis, you could hear like down the hall as he's lecturing. And then like Tolkien had a very bad habit of like talking to the blackboard <laughs> with his back to the audience. Oh, we've all had a professor like that. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, but it, it was just like, seriously though, like I'm just, how cool would it have? Oh, just, just the fact like you've got one of a fantasy writer who was literally taught by two of the major fantasy writers of the modern era. Yes. Yes. I, I want to get in their brains, get in their memories, get in Tolkien and Lewis's classes. I would just be happy with their syllabi. Yes. It's like, oh, um, Professor Tolkien, how did you teach Anglo-Saxon literature? Quick to the Bodleian. Yes. <laughs> I mean, seriously, Oxford has to have records of those somewhere. They must. It's got to be some syllabi somewhere. I, I will. I will syllabi them. I know it was low hanging fruit. It, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's laughing. Oh my goodness. It's my trademark. I've I've had students complain in the evaluations about them, and I'm like, it's just going to make me keep doing it more. Exactly. You know, the more we, the harder, the harder we argue. Let's talk about some tropes. There's some common teacher tropes that we see in the media. I mean, I'm, I'm immediately thinking of Mr. Feeney and the, the wise teacher trope. And you have, there, there's some, some common tropes that you, that we see in the media. And are they, do you think these tropes present a realistic or helpful image of us as teachers? And what are some of the ones that aren't so helpful? Like I can think of a million off the top of my head right now, but what are some of the tropes that make our jobs just a little bit harder? What do you guys think? Oh, um, oh I have thoughts on this. Um, so th this is primarily because I'm, I'm teaching post secondary school and Either side of the media, less so one than the other, are presenting college professors as we are out to indoctrinate and brainwash and it's our way or the highway. And while that, I'm not going to say that's not like, oh, that's 100% false, because I'm sure there are people out there in that profession who are like, yes, that fits them to the T. But the majority of us Look, we can't even get your children to read the syllabus. Like if if I had those powers <laughs> that you you give to me, do you not think I would use them to get your if, child to do their homework? Oh, indeed. To, to capitalize their name, to spell check their essays. Bless. Oh. Sorry, sorry. That that that's a uh, it's it's a sore spot, I'm sure. It's a very sore spot. Um and it's yeah, I, I mentioned the whole oh your professors are gonna be out to get you. And it's like, no, we're not out to get you, but we're not going to spoon feed you either. You're going to have to do your part. And that's, you know, yes, you are actually going to have to read the textbook, do the assignments. You are actually, if you have a question, you are going to have to ask it. Now, whether that is coming to office hours or sending me an email, 
And and it's also the whole, you can't wait until like the day before it's due to let me know. I have no idea what we're doing on this essay. Mm. It's, so it's like, yeah, we're not out to get you. It's just you, I don't know. And I think it's part partly because society has gotten students so used to the spoon feeding and teaching them to the test and you can turn things in until the very last minute. And it's not teaching the initiative that you, you do need some initiative to learn that I don't understand this. Hmm. How could I figure it out instead of just, I don't understand this. I guess I just won't know. And so, it can yeah. be hard to, to teach that initiative because it is a learned skill. It you know, is. It's not, and, it's not, and, and it's to what um, Jordan was speaking to earlier. We have this fixed mindset of either I know it or I don't. So I don't want to look stupid if I am going to ask the question. And and the sucky part is by the time they get to college, the consequent, they, when they need to have that skill, and this is the first time many of them are learning it, mm -hmm. there is a financial price tag to oh, yeah this and yeah you failed the class i'm i'm sorry but you didn't you didn't do x y and z mm -hmm. and it's gosh it's yeah I, I i have a lot of thoughts on that yeah. but it's like i just want to make it clear the majority of college stu of college professors they will meet you halfway you just have to do your get your half yeah yeah, most most people, most teachers will, yeah. will meet you halfway. I mean, yeah. Unfortunately, there are kind of have to as well. Right, right, exactly. That's, you know, because I, I there will be scenarios where my coordinator will come to me and say, you know, what can we do? This person's like just on the edge, um, you know, and it's like, well, I can't just say no a lot of the time. So if, you know, if they're way under, that's one thing. But if it's on the edge, then yeah, I've it's had weird. a lot of scenarios of it's it's such a weird scenario for me because the students come in and they expect me to know everything, which is unrealistic for me because mm -hmm. technology changes every year. Yeah. And there's too many variations of the technology uh, to possibly know it all anyways. So trying to get past this like assumption that I should know everything that I should know every detail about every piece of gear that we're using. Um, or if I don't, then like, why are they here kind of thing? And it's getting back to that. Like you have to put in some effort yourself though. Like I'm not going to just <laughs> give you all the answers because it doesn't even make sense to do that. There's been a lot of parental uh, assumptions, I guess, in that mm -hmm. way for, for my college students. And like, you know, why is my kid not doing as well as I want them to be? <laughs> it's not up to me totally. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a tricky thing to try and, because, you know, I don't want to say that it's not up to me totally. Um, because I firmly believe that because this happened to me and I'm sure it happened to a lot of us that, you know, at one point in your life, you probably had a teacher that made the difference um, for whatever topic it was. And I think that's what I've seen a lot in some of my peers is that people kind of forget that that could be you for these mm -hmm. people. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to be all like, you know, world changing every day but that you could be the person that inspires someone to want to learn this thing. I think that's important to keep in mind. Uh, so it's kind of back and forth between the, you know, is this up to me or is it up to them? And you kind of have to find the balance and keep the parents away from uh, the scenario as much as possible. In my case, I have some with private lessons. It happens a lot where the parent wants to come in and I'm like, no, no, leave the room and let your kid learn alone because a, like every time that's happened, the parent will answer the questions for mm -hmm. the student. Nope. 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 Like, nope. Nope. You're, you're like, you're robbing the kid of 
I don't even care what the answer is or if they get the right answer or not. I just want them to be able to think it through and come up with an answer, you know? And uh, I've had a couple scenarios where the, you know, the dad plays guitar and uh, it's just the worst. <laughs> and I get these like, why aren't you teaching this faster kind of thing? And I'm like, actually, it's you that's slowing this down by being here. <laughs> Uh -huh. Fun. Nick, you, uh, you had something you wanted to say earlier. No, just kind of piggybacking off of Rebecca and part of Jordan's awkward parents coming into the classroom trying to help teach kind of a thing. But there's, you know, I feel like in pop culture, particularly, I think it started with high school going back to like the early 80s with like, Fer you know, or in late 80s with like Ferris Bueller's Day Off, The Breakfast Club. Um, you've got these teachers that are like condescending, but also dumb as well, you know? And then I feel like later college professors became part of that trope as well. Because I feel like, you know, if you watch something like, um, oh, Animal House or whatever, the professors are very smart. They're just kind of morally, morally reprehensible or whatever because they sleep with students and things like that. But, um, you know, I think that trans like it was high school teachers are dumb and condescending. And then college professors got kind of incorporated into that trope. And, um, you know, I even think of like, re I'm a big adult cartoon person. So like Mr. Garrison from South Park is like the epitome of like not knowing anything and like, you know, being terrible to their students. Um, and then, of course, Mr. Golden Fo Folds from Rick and Morty, if anyone is familiar with Rick and Morty, Mr. Golden Folds is not a great teacher. Uh, he kind of, the latest season, he kind of had a little bit of a redemption arc, perhaps as a, as a teacher. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a, there's Rick and Morty, uh, quotes in the chat. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I just think about this idea of like, I think there are people that, that had, they've had to have had an experience like that for that to become such a massive trope within pop culture. And so how do we learn how to like get on students levels and like you were, um, you know, Rebecca, like you were saying, if we had the indoctrinating powers we had, we would use it to, to get students to just engage at all. Um, and I think of Jordan, Jordan brought up Victor Wooten and he talks about like, there's no such thing as a wrong note because you're not jamming to like the most people aren't listening and they're going, oh yes, I love this, uh, that they were using this scale or whatever, uh, you know, they're, they're jamming to what it sounds like. Um, and I think that for us to be able to be humble so that we also don't know everything, allow students to teach us something while also leading um, and and getting them involved in the creative process, I don't know. I don't know how how and when or if at least in in the United States, if we're going to be able to shake off this uh, um, anti intellectual kind of trope within education. Yeah, because unfortunately, it is affecting us as as teachers. I mean, I don't know what it's like in Canada, Jordan, but, you know, we have state legislators who are just not giving school public schools funding because of these images that people have of teachers. And some of it is from pop culture. Some of it is just from a sort of workers mentality, like very blue, almost like, you know, you're a teacher because you couldn't do anything else kind of mentality. And it's I like, I'd say I'd yeah. say it goes I'd say it goes back to more of the those who, those who can't teach mentality. I mean my like my fam I come from a very blue collar family, but education was always, you know, that's you need to you need to go to college, you know, always very highly prized. Mm -hmm. Um but it, what I also think's coming out of it um, is something uh Brett Devereaux um wrote an article that was in the New York Times about this, um, that col colleges are becoming uh, more than vocational schools. Mm -hmm. And that's like, and I want to make it clear, neither I and definitely Dr. Devereaux was not, you know, downing vocational schools. Those are a fantastic um, educational option if that is where someone's interests are. 
But what he was getting at was that the focus in especially community colleges and even some of the more regional four-year schools is becoming less on the teaching you how to critically think and the liberal arts education and more into job training, training you for a job, training you. And yes, the goal of college is we we do want you to be able to be employed um, afterwards. But he brings up a very valid point that what's happening is if we are making these regional colleges and these community colleges that the less advantaged populations that that's their first in for some, the only access they have to higher ed is just job training. Then we're create we're going back to a class system where only the Uber rich can afford to learn how to think. Um, and, and, and that's what I also see is the, one of the dangers we've got. On our on the educational horizon, at least at least in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, especially with. There's... Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, especially with people like cutting a lot of the liberal arts from their programs. I mean, like, Joe, don't I, I? I think we need to not let you get started on the West Virginia math program. Oh, and we just uh, we have in the chat <laughs> cough WVU cough cough cough. There it is. Sorry, Jordan. Go ahead. <laughs> it's okay. I was just going to say, yeah, that there, that's happening a lot here. Where for, you know, why do we need music class? Why do we need the art class? Um, things like that happening, and they those programs get cut pretty often, especially in the smaller schools. And I think that, you know, in my mind, a lot of it comes down to this kind of idea of what talent is, maybe, you know, and how. You know, this person's really talented at hockey. This person's really talented at, you know, this other sport or or writing or whatever it is. And how there's no, there's never really anyone who's like their talent is learning or their talent, like that's never praised in the same way. Um, or, you know, someone's talent, you know, we were talking about those who can't do teach, but what if the thing that they're doing is teaching? What if that is the goal, you know? Um, but I don't think that it's ever really seen that way, you know, to the ominous they that we're kind of talking about, whoever that might be. Um, but I, you know, I remember specifically being in college myself and, you know, we went around the room, what does everyone want to do when they graduate? Because we were on a condensed program. It was one straight year from September straight through to August and then we were done. Um, and so it was over fast and it was like, what do you want to do when we're done? And I was the only person that said, I want to teach. And uh, first of all, that that kind of opened my eyes a little bit of like, wow, really interesting. I guess that I'll have that market then. <laughs> um, but, you know, it shows a little bit that, you know, it seems like the general consensus, obviously not for people like us, but for other people might be the, you know, that you know, teaching doesn't really count as, you know, the goal. It shouldn't count as one of the objectives. It's not until you spend some time with someone who you can tell, you know, the people that we've talked about and whatnot and, and the people in this call, I'm sure, that, you know, you can see what a teacher really is. And uh, I feel like a lot of those people, you know, it's almost too bad that, you know, again, the people that we're talking about, the can the hypothetical person, um, maybe didn't have anyone like that when they went through the system. Um, so they don't know that there's any value there, you know, because they were never influenced like that by someone. Um I think tying into this also, there's this very common notion um that we are there at least at the pre-collegiate levels, uh, are there to babysit children. And I've, I've definitely heard people talk like, I don't know what to do with my kid because they're not at school today. And I'm like, well, I'm was not a huge your... pandemic thing. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not your babysitter. So you should, 
you know, like you should you should come up with things to do with your kids when they're not in school because I that's not what we are here for, you know, like uh, or can this student uh, this thankfully is not an issue uh, so much in my current job, but in and in, in one place, uh, a a parent asked me, well, can uh, my son, you know, can't do x in your class today can he just come and sit in the class and i said well he's got to do that in class because that's what we're doing in class today if if he can't do that he just shouldn't come to class at all you should just take him home you know and they said well but but we can't do that because of blah 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 and i just thought what is your concept of what we are doing in school because if you if what you think is school is the place you send your kids so that you can have child care while you go off and do i don't know your job or something else that might be perfectly legitimate or something that is not legitimate at all or what have you i it just you've completely misconceived why we're here and i think this also ties in to that anti-intellectual um, trend that we see, especially in the United States, where people don't want, um, don't think education is a good thing per se, um, and and I I I wanted to bring this up as well. I do think this also ties into the very peanuts idea of a teacher. If you watch Charlie Brown in a classroom. It's the the teacher and my students know this and they don't even re- they've never even really seen Charlie Brown. They know that the teacher goes wah 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 wah, and it's not. Mm-hmm. It's like what the teacher says isn't important. It's it, you know that's not part of life. That's not part of this is, and and I think that ties a lot into what everyone's been saying, but also especially to what Jordan was saying because I know, um, I was I was the good at math student, so I was going to do something with my life, you know, like that was sort of the idea. And so I loved doing the teaching type activities when I was in school. Like I liked the presentations and I liked I remember my grandmother's Sunday school class. I I uh I taught for her once and I really, really loved it. And I, I just like I really loved teaching. Um and I didn't even think that was really a possibility for me when I was a kid because that wasn't one of those jobs that I could go and be successful with um and listeners can't see but I'm doing scare quotes around a lot of what I'm saying right now uh and the um because and and it wasn't until I was in college and I thought no wait education is something is something really good and it's something really valuable and I want to bring that to people like that's that's something that i want to do in the world is to bring this make this uh make this better for people and it, it it's just you know it's not it, it there's a conversation i feel like that's not being had about where this comes from and i really do think that this uh, the this notion of teaching not being a valid goal is a real problem mm. I think that also through it because i've been teaching you know in private or classroom type scenarios for probably like close to 10 years now and it was really only over the pandemic that there was like a really noticeable shift in behavior and expectation from the students um where you know i i had an online class and I had had online classes before, you know, when the pandemic first started. So things hadn't really changed much yet. But in this class later on, you know, two two years or so into the pandemic, um, I would, you know, ask the chat basically because nobody had their camera on because we couldn't force them to. Um, and I would ask a question in the chat and get nothing at all. I'm talking like maybe two messages in a three hour class in, and I'm teaching something that's like based on them being like, Oh, that's cool. Let me try this. You know, what, what would happen if you did this kind of thing? And uh, yeah, to try and do that with this group 
was really, really, really difficult. And you could really sense, and some of them would just say it, you know, you could sense this kind of like, okay, but uh, what is the number that I need to be passing this course? Um, so let's just figure that out and I'll do what I have to do to make that happen and then see ya. Um, and it's a really tough thing to try and tackle as a teacher, I think, because it's like, again, is that up to me? Is that up to, I mean, they're paying for it. <laughs> so, you know, what's the deal here? What's the protocol in terms of, you know, and then you get into the whole thing where it's like, well, the college isn't going to fail all of them, you know? And then, you know, as the teacher, you're like, well, maybe you should be, though, because otherwise, we're, what are we even doing this for? You know, it's like just Yeah. something to spend the time doing, apparently. Um, and as it like in my field, especially because when these people graduate, a lot of the time I'm like working with them immediately after because Ottawa is such a small music community, um, you know, I. I will see them at gigs and stuff, you know? Um, and so I don't want them to graduate and like not know what they're doing, you know, because I have to work with them and stuff. And it, you know, looks terrible on me if they don't know anything and, and, you know, they don't get work that way. Like they just can't get work if they don't know what they're doing. But then you have this whole dynamic where it's like, well, they got to pass though. And I'm like, well, they shouldn't though, you know? So it's it's a weird dynamic to try and play around with. Yeah, I think one of the core things that we've all been talking about is that as human beings, and especially in the culture that we're in, failure is a really difficult concept. Like if we are afraid to fail because of the stakes that are attached to them when learning to fail is part of Oh God, no. And no, no Child Left Behind did nobody any favors. You're absolutely right, Rebecca Davis. I will curse No Child Left Behind until the day I die. Because it just, there were the consequences for it were so dire. Like if a school did not pass these tests, they would get shut down. And that does not, how does that help anybody? You know, that just, and, you know, people would lose their jobs and schools would close down and kids would lose their schooling. And it just, it's counterintuitive to me. But it's also, a, I wonder if it's a case also of learning needs to have a purpose rather than learning for the sake of learning. It, it goes to, it goes to that whole concept of your education is to prepare you for a job and for a job only. You're not just, right. you know, it's, I've, I've had a student who, um, you know, was like, oh, I'd love to take a literature class, but I don't need it for my program. And it's like, and, and just telling them, well, you don't, you can take it because uh, you know it I, I understand in college it becomes an issue of mm -hmm. well do I have the extra money to pay for this credit hour but and this particular student that that um, finances weren't going to be an issue but finding out well yeah you you can take a class you don't you don't and I'm doing air quotes for the listeners you don't need you can do it and you can do it to enjoy it um I think we need to encourage more auditing. Yeah. You know, like let's do a, okay, do a minimal fee. If, you know, colleges and schools have to make a um, profit, but yet we have gotten away from this. You learn something because you want to learn it. And it doesn't necessarily have to have a practical purpose. Um, I mean, no one, as much as I love Tolkien, no one speaks Elvish, yet I learned how to write in Tingwar simply because I thought it looked pretty. And why the heck not? Exactly. But yeah, it definitely goes back to this whole, your, your, the task of education is to prepare you for the workplace and that's it. But this is, it's actually funny that you mentioned this because Joe, uh, Joe just put this in the chat about um, about the district-wide curriculum and when did education primarily 
become about prepping people for the modern factory. This is, this is, if you look at the history of education, I literally took a history of education class when I was at teacher's college and we have a factory model in our schools now because of people like Henry Ford. We started turning our schools into factory models to help kids practice for when they got out into the workforce. And, and, and then like the Ford automobile, they will be found on the side of the road dead in the academic world. It's just, ugh. it's a very, very, uh, it's American. a kind of race to the finish line, but we don't know what the finish line is. And we don't know that that's not the point anyways. Right. And I mean, this might be more doom and gloom. And here, here here's another stereotype of a college professor. We're all doom and gloom. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, with the way society is viewing education and its purpose, I have, and I used to not think these were legitimate fears because I didn't think, oh, this won't happen. But it's becoming more and more legitimate as time goes on post-COVID that it's we're going back to a society of classes where we have the educated elite who, and then we have the working class, the factory workers, the industry operators, all of that. And it's the... The educated class, then, if they're those are the elites, if the if only the rich are educated, who and have that liberal arts education, then they have the they have control. Knowledge really is power, and it's just like do 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 we not see the dangers that this having one one um, wealth group in charge will cause. I remember specifically being even like scoffed at a little bit when I was in school for, for thinking that I might go to the local college instead of the local university. Um, Now the irony of that is that when I was finishing my, for my, my one year, I saw a lot of the people that uh, went to university and tanked out of it coming to the college afterwards that's a different, mm-hmm. uh, conversation but um, but it was like the teachers and the parents of and I'll just say the parents of the richer kids um, and then therefore their kids that were always like oh why why would you go why would you just go there you know right. don't you want right. don't you want to go to university and apparently why? that was way better <laughs> Why would you want to be a teacher? Yeah. Why would you want to be a teacher? Like it's the same mentality. Society uh, needs a needs to have people from all socioeconomic backgrounds who have the skills to think creatively, to think critically, and just I don't want to say to think, but I mean it's an essential part of what makes us human. And we can't just limit it to you have to have this, you know, you have to meet this wealth bracket. Mm-hmm. We also, like yeah. Sorry, you go ahead. No, I was just going to say we also just need to unlearn what learning means. You know, is it about, I mean, I'm learning all the time just by listening to podcasts. I'm learning all the time by reading Tolkien and pfft, I'm learning all the time just by having conversations with people down the street about, you know, or people in the Prancing Pony podcast discord about things I had no clue even existed. It's learning is a lifelong thing. And I would rather admit that I know nothing than pretend I know everything. It's a different topic to get into, but it is interesting because we are, you know, as we're having this conversation about where education is at, there's this simultaneous thing, at least to me, going on where you always have to be improving yourself and you always have to be, you know, being better in some way in your life, otherwise you're wasting it. Um, And it's interesting because that kind of mentality 
I think is a little dangerous because it just perpetuates this kind of, I got to do this thing to get it done so that I can do the next thing and then I can do the next thing. And, and, but what for, you know, I think we're, we're missing that step of what's it all for or what's your goal. And it seems like there's no time to talk about that because we got to just get it done. Yeah. But that starts early in schools and then continues on until you retire. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's a pretty simplified version of it, but it happens a lot, you know? It's just, I got to get this next thing done so I can get to the next grade, to the next promotion, to the next et cetera, et cetera. And then before you know it, you're at the end of the line. <laughs> Exactly. And you forgot to enjoy the journey for what it was. <laughs> so not to get too all... intense Yeah. about it but But there's there's hope in that in that too because I mean I'm sure Mr. Feeney experienced some really frustrating teach um some really frustrating meetings and also there's just so there's so much pressure. There's so much pressure to be a teacher and especially post-COVID and we're, there's a lot that's on our shoulders and not visibly though and that's the that's the that's issue. part of the big issue Mm -hmm. so And, and I think, I think it just comes back to, especially post COVID, we're expected to give so much grace and yet we're, we're not receiving any in exchange. mm -hmm. it's the other it's yeah what else can what else can you give mm -hmm. instead of how can we give to you well how can we help you yeah The other trope that really gets me, especially in media when it comes to teaching, is the is the savior trope. And this is a I mean, this is a trap that we talked about with Nick um, about, you know, doing too much and making sure you're only taking the bites that you can, you know, and not, you know, make sure you don't burn the candle at both ends, because it's really easy to fall into the savior trope and fall into the savior trap. Like I have to like you because you care. You care about your students and you want to see them succeed. But, you know, like you were saying, Jordan, we can't pass everybody. We can't, you know, and and making making kids afraid to fail is only going to deter, going to be a detriment to them. But then at the same time, you've got kids who are literally just showing are literally showing up to school because they don't have anywhere else to go. And this is the safe space that they can be. And. How do you, you have to take care of yourself as well. And yes, you have to give grace to your students, but you also have give, have to give some grace for yourself because you are one person and you're, but you're being asked to wear all these hats and carry all these things on your shoulders, but you are one person. One of the one of the best teaching experiences that I had was kind of midway through the pandemic um, when we were allowed again to go into the school a little bit. We were only allowed to have five people max in the studio. Uh, so a class was five people and it was the best time because I could individually teach each person and specifically see what was going on, what they weren't understanding. And, you know, you could see pretty clearly that by the end of, you know, second semester out of three semesters, they were way, way further past any other year because that time was all for them instead of 15 or 20 people. Um, and I think that's the real, like, you know, superpower, I guess, for a teacher is the the ability to to read everyone's individual journey and try and figure out how to react to it in the best way. Um, and that's also getting harder and harder with, you know, trying to push class sizes bigger and uh, get more people through. It's tough. It's a tough profession, but it's, yes, it's worth it, but also take care of yourself too. Okay. Which is why we have summers off. Okay. Everybody who thinks that summers off are not. Yes, Becca. Well, and here, here's the thing. Some teachers are also teaching during the summer. So this is true. <laughs> I, like, Yeah. I, I have, yeah, I, it's, 
summers off. What 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 are these summers off? This is true. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Talking specifically about uh I, I should I forgot there. Summer classes in universities, but yes, yeah. There are teachers who are teaching through through to the summer or who have multiple jobs because don't forget, we also have to feed our families <laughs> because equitable wages, not always a thing. Yes. Teacher, teachers don't get free meals at no. school. No, they do not. Like the, the best thing, and we still talk about it in my department, that admin ever did for us was they bought us a big box of Keurig K-cup mm. um, coffees. And it was like you would have thought it was Christmas morning in our department. And it was like, basically I was like, yeah, yeah, you need to overload the class. Yeah. You got it. How many more do you need? I mean, it really was. And it's, it's so funny how just little things like that, or like, Hey, you know, this, this, um, they've, someone's donated subway lunches for the teachers, like what that does for teacher morale it's insane. It it's is. Like, it does not take much to make us happy. <laughs> we will. It's like we will give you the moon for a donut. <laughs> Pizza at staff meetings. Here you go. Exactly. Thanks. Is there a raise to go with that too? But little steps. Little steps. Little steps. <laughs> exactly. Little steps. All the fun things you get to look forward to, Nick. <laughs> You know, I'm excited. I'm excited. It's it's like I said, it's 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 tough, but you know, someone's got to do it. You know, we're in the trenches. We're just yeah. we're just that tough. You know. And Nick, yeah. I'll tell you one thing, and I I have this um, gift on my desk, so I can see it every day. I'm at work and remind myself of why I do this. It's a little dancing cow that a student got me a few years back. That says when you press its hoof, it says, "Hey, everybody." bust a move and it's the best gift I ever got from a student and yeah it's like that that I don't I mean I'm not saying do it for the cow the cow toy but specifically that one y yeah <laughs> you've it, it's w when you know you have you have made an impact on someone even if yeah. it's just with your bad jokes yes it is, it is worth it. I mean, and that's the, that's the fun thing about teaching is we will complain about it all day long and someone will look at you and go, why would you do that? And you go, because well, I love it. I love it. I mean, I get free hugs every day from my third graders. They're adorable. They're absolutely adorable. It's it's one of those it's one of those professions where unfortunately we people see the Mr. Garrisons and they see the 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 teacher from Ferris Bueller, but it's the Mr. Feeney's, it's the uh well, some of the teachers from Abbott Elementary, maybe, but it's the it's beautiful. It's a, it's a, it, it can be a fun profession. It can be really bogged down with politics and it can be really bogged down with the things that you don't expect to come with teaching. But the kids make it really fun. The kids make it worth it. A congratulations, Frog. I love that. Yeah, it was really <laughs> random. She just, she, she, I had given some news in class one, one day. And the next day she had brought in a piece of paper that she had drawn a, a frog with a party hat on and a little thing coming out of its mouth. That's uh, adorable. It's like it's I, I Dr. Torres, I made you a congratulations frog. And I was like, I've never heard of a congratulations frog, but thank you. That's beautiful. <laughs> I will never forget the final creative projects I had. Um, I think I told you about this one, Becca, of when I taught uh, the Lord of the Rings, I did a three month unit. And at the end of every month, the students had to make a creative project for uh, the Lord of the Rings or for, for each book. And these two boys made a Lego stop motion film of each book. And it was very well done. 
I, they had I, somebody beating up Sauron at the end of the Two Towers one. Oh, no, it was Sauron. No, not Sauron. Sorry. Saruman was throwing a tantrum going, no, no, no. I can't believe I lost. It was wonderful. I So I've done, done something similar to that with my lit classes. So when I did Fellowship of the Ring, someone made Limbus. Another student made, uh, and they didn't just have to cook, but another student made uh, Mrs. Maggot's mushrooms. <gasps> the um, roast chicken. No one made roast chicken for that class, but for my world lit class, I had a student who made made out of cardboard a model of a castle that is still, and I mean, this thing's big. It's still in the English department. Oh my God. I also had another student who made a medieval feast. Like she looked up how they would have done the cooking preparation and all of that. So it was, and, and she brought it and we ate, like, that's what we had for lunch that day. Like she, she bought, I, and I, I want, I did not tell her to do this, but like she went and bought saffron for this meal. And I was like, do you, do you know how much that, like, she's like, yeah, it was expensive, but I figured I'd use it for other things too. Cause this really got me into cooking, but it was like, yeah. <laughs> That's expensive. Yeah. You may, you but, may, there may be moments where you have to put like a price limit. On right. Right. But projects. she's like, I want, she said, no, I want it to be authentic. Oh my God. And then I was like, and now guys, you can see why only the rich and the nobles were able to eat like this. Exactly. Everybody else just got maggoty bread for three, for three stinking, stinking days. days. <laughs> yes. From the, from the annoying tropes to the joys. That was a wonderful segue guys. I love it. Listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to hit the subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or your other favorite podcast feeds. If you enjoyed listening, please leave a rating and a review as well. You can read and find out more about Teaching with Magic by visiting our website, teachingwithmagic.blog. You can leave a message on our podcast page, read past Teaching with Magic posts, and check out our book lists on our affiliate page. We also invite you to support us on Patreon. You'll have access to bonus material, our Discord channel, live Q&As, and you'll get a sneak peek at future products such as lesson plans, worksheets, and other teaching tools. The link is always available in our show notes and the podcast page on our website. Thanks again for joining us, and as always, keep making magic. <laughs>